good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome. My name is Jordan, Jordan Brennan. I'm a PhD student here at York. And on behalf of the Capitalist Power, sorry, Forum on Capitalist Power Conference Organizing Committee, we'd like to welcome you to York University and to the first day of the conference. Uh, now I'd like to call up the Associate Dean of the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies to give the welcoming remarks, Barbara Crow. Thank you. Thank you. I have to tell you, it's been quite a while since I've been in a room full of guys. Um, so this is making me wondering what's going on that aren't women interested in the crisis of capital or the crisis of theory or feminist scholars. So this is interesting uh, uh, observation about this. So um, I want to very much uh, congratulate and thank the organizers. Uh, Jordan came to see me in the spring last year about uh, organizing this event and getting funding for it. And it's really quite impressive to see uh, how your idea started and your committee and where you got in the program. It's absolutely marvelous and fabulous. And in particular, I'm really <coughs> pleased to see such uh, integration of grad students and uh, full-time faculty, part-time faculty uh, in this program. So I wish you a very uh, engaging uh, <coughs> a uh, couple of days and hope you're able to resolve <laughs> the crisis of capital for us and have a wonderful conference and welcome to York University. Just take a moment to um, introduce and identify the other conference organizers. Uh, Sean Stars is a PhD student here at York in the Department of Political Science. And Troy Cochran in the back is also at York, PhD student in Social and Political Thought. And in the way of scheduling, our next uh, panel, the one after this one, will take place after lunch. And that will have two faculty guest speakers, Leo Panich and David McNally, looking at the crisis of capital and the crisis of theory. But to the first panel, we have three really interesting presentations looking at value theory. The first one will be given by Professor George Commonell, who will also be our first faculty guest speaker. Uh, Professor Commonell is the chair of the Department of Political Science. He has researched interests in the feudal foundations of modern Europe and looking at the historical specificity of the development of capitalism in Europe. He is the author of an upcoming book, or is working on the finishing touches of the book, The Feudal Foundations of Modern Europe. And he will be talking about Marx's value theory. So welcome, Professor Commonell. Thank you for speaking. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, hello, all. I'm uh, going to get right into things so as not to hold up um, the conference. Um, what I want to do is talk about value and uh, the associated issue of fetishism of commodities, and to do so in ways that those here who have made a study of Marx might find relatively clear and obvious, but which in fact, even among Marxists, has not been well understood. And um, particularly among those who have rejected Marx's thought, and above all, the concept of value, the labor theory of value specifically, um, I think a great deal of it, of that, has to do with the failure to understand uh, Marx's concept um, and its implications. Now, one of the things I, I want to uh, admit from the beginning is that the terms that Marx himself often used in expressing his ideas have contributed uh, to this misunderstanding. Um, it's not as if they have to be read in ways that imply something he didn't mean. Uh, he did know what he was saying. But the terms, particularly over the course of a very lengthy uh, book, like Volume One of Capital, um, periodically, there's a reversion to a form of expression that makes the labor theory of value sound, in some profound ways, metaphysical. And what I want to really make clear is that there is nothing metaphysical about Marx's concept of value. Um, indeed, what I want to say is that necessarily, if a value analysis of capital and capitalism <clears throat> as a system is possible, it must necessarily follow that a price analysis is also possible and that they will be ultimately equivalent in what they have to say. They will start from different 
foundations, theoretically, methodologically, and they will have different points of emphasis. They will reveal different things. But it is precisely the fact that value and price have an inherent connection that is uh, behind Marx's work, or one uh, aspect of Marx's work. And it's not a question of alternative. It is not that a value analysis of capitalism is correct and a price analysis must be incorrect. And so part of what I want to do is to clarify these things and to demonstrate that whether you want to accept it or not, as of course I think you should, a value analysis is quite different than is commonly uh, understood. And this then particularly helps uh, com make comprehensible the idea of the fetishism of commodities, which is very often trivialized in the way it's understood, whereas in fact it's quite profound. <clears throat> um, so it is universally recognized that Marx's conception of value is based on the relationship of commodity to labor. Um, but as this is understood generally, it inclines towards a view that, as I sometimes put it, the commodity is a little bit like um, a battery. Um, an empty shell, but a battery into which you add value, and that it, along the various stages in its production, more value is added until it's fully complete with uh, a charge of value. And that in some sense, labor is metaphysically charging up the commodity. Um, and I've just chosen from the first chapter of Capital some examples that lead to this kind of reading. There are much else, I mean, I, I don't want to correct Marx, but much else um, does exist to make clear what he really means. But listen to these things. He refers to, quote, the, and all these are quotes, the material depositories of exchange value when he talks about commodities. The amount of labor crystallized in that article. He refers to commodities in which equal quantities of labor are embodied have the same value. The labor contained in a commodity. As values, commodities are mere congelations of human labor. And one coat would now contain only half the labor time embedded in 20 yards of linen. So this notion of the commodity as a container or an embodiment of labor is there to be seen if one wants. And this is picked up and is actually used in many courses on Marx, both by non-Marxists and by Marxists. You can go find books that uh, will be filled with this sort of uh, analysis. <clears throat> and increasingly, uh, you can find that this is not seen merely as a metaphorical, but in some sense, that's what the labor theory of value is really about. Now, Lenin famously said, it is impossible to understand Marx's capital, and especially its first chapter, without having thoroughly studied and understood the whole of Hegel's logic. Well, if you look at capital, clearly Marx did not intend the working people of his day to have to go off and study Hegel before he read Capital. Uh, capital was, as long as it was, and filled with the number of examples as it has, so that it could be understood by working men and women um, reading it in the few hours they had when they weren't working. Um, and I do think, in some ways, that statement is an absurdity, but it actually does have a kernel of truth, and it does help us uh, uh, see an absolutely central characteristic of the book Capital and of Marx's thought more generally. And here I want to make clear that I think that there are approaches to the relationship between Hegel and Marx that trivialize both of them. And again, many of the views of, of Hegel's um, idealism as being expressed in terms of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, a, a formulation that you'd be hard pressed to find anywhere in Hegel's work, um, don't help. Um, what really we need to understand is that capital and Marx's thought more generally from 
1844 manuscripts on, from the very first time that he sat and read the political economists, Marx understands that capitalism reflects a totality. And it is only comprehensible in terms of a totality, and that he proceeds on the basis, and this is something he does get from Hegel. Um, I'm not sure it would be the only place, but it's an obvious place, having been familiar with Hegel. The concept of society as an integral totality that is an organic whole. And that element of total integration is something that you know, Hegel is at great pains to develop in his work um, in the philosophy of right. He most obviously follows uh, the actual model of Aristotle's um, uh, uh, politics to look at the form of the social whole, to look at the idea that uh, humanity is a zoon politicon, a political animal, but in that sense an animal of the polis, of society. And to look at it in, from Hegel's point of view, not only as a, a uh, synchronic totality, but he also adds the diachronic dimension of development from the whole that existed at the time of Aristotle through historical development to the whole that existed in his day, which is expressed and captured in um, his uh, philosophy of right, which is an account of the development of a whole over time, which always maintains a synchronic unity, but which is in turn developmental and leads to successive forms. And that is the sense in which Marx has an essentially Hegelian view of history. It's not, in fact, in any sense uh, uh, dependent upon Hegel's texts, but is, in fact, a view that society has a developmental character and a systemic unity which must be understood, and that it is in relation to this systemic unity that his critique of political economy uh, must find expression. And this is, of course, very much in opposition to Margaret Thatcher's even more famous quote than Lenin's, that there is no such thing as society. For Marx, there is society, and there is no possibility of understanding anything in human experience except in relation to the facticity of social experience, of society having this integral character um, in which we cannot help but be social in our life. Um, in his introduction to the manuscripts known as the Grundrisse, Marx starts with the uh, object being material production, the immediate object. And then he says, second sentence of the introduction he offers, individuals producing in society, hence socially determined individual production, is of course the point of departure. The individual and isolated hunter and fisherman with whom Smith and Ricardo begin belongs among the unimaginative conceits of the 18th century Robinsonades. Continuing, the human being is, in the most literal sense, a zoon politicon, not merely a gregarious animal, but an animal which can individuate itself only in the midst of society. Production by an isolated individual outside society, a rare exception which may well occur when a civilized person in whom the social forces are already dynamically present is cast by accident to the wilderness, is as much of an absurdity as the development of language without individuals living together and talking together. And it is that concept of society as involving necessarily agents, living animal beings, who have a social form through their interaction with each other, without which they have no language, no consciousness, and without which they have no institutions or forms of social action. It is always and absolutely the social which precedes the individual, even if the social is predicated upon individual animals. The field of social existence permeates the reality of human existence, and it is impossible to be human without being social. This is fundamental to the character of our species. 
<clears throat> now, as Marx also observed, the embeddedness of human individuals within greater social wholes is especially evident in earlier epochs of social existence. And I, I won't go into kinship rules, etc. What he points out is that it is only late in the modern era that we have a, a form of society in which, as he says, the various forms of social connectedness become external and instrumental means for social action, that individuals become, in a sense, individuated within society. But, he continues, the epic which produces this standpoint, that of the isolated individual, is also precisely that of the hitherto most developed social form and from this standpoint, general relations, I'm oh, sorry, social relations. And that is the, the whole point here, that the development of human society has been a development of sociality, at, in exactly as Hegel pointed out, also the development of human individuation, but an individuation that is never less than social. And so it is simply not true, as if you were reading uh, John Locke, that in the beginning you had essentially frock-coated bourgeois of the 18th century wandering around in the woods, coming together accidentally and creating society out of convenience. That as a species, we were social before we were human, and our humanity is always social and most fully developed in the form of capitalism, or at least to date. And obviously, there's the hope it'll be even more fully social in the future. Now, this perspective is the, the core of his critique of political economy. However, while he takes the social totality as point of departure in the Grundrisse, <laughs> famously, capital begins with the commodity, with the individual engaging in exchange freely, an exchange of equivalence by mutual agreement with another individual. So seemingly, the individual is the starting point of capital because in order to understand it as a system, one must understand it at this micro level of exchange and not only as a totality. And this is indeed um, uh, quite fundamental. At the beginning of Capital, Chapter 1, Section 1, Marx uh, observes, I'm, I'm just going to read a section that I think is important to understand. Uh, some people might think that if the value of a commodity is determined by the quantity of labor spent on it, the more idle and unskillful the laborer, the more valuable would his commodity be, because more time would be required in its production. The labor, however, that forms the substance of value is homogeneous human labor, expenditure of one uniform labor power. The total labor power of society, which is embodied in the sum total of the values of all commodities produced by that society, counts here as one homogeneous mass of human labor power, composed though it be of innumerable individual units. And he goes on to say, the value of a commodity would therefore remain constant if the labor time required for its production also remained constant. But the latter changes with every variation in the productiveness of labor. Now, what's crucial here is to understand that while he is beginning with the individual facing another individual and coming to an agreement that what they are exchanging is equivalent. Now, there must be some basis for that. And the point of the labor theory of value is at that moment in time, it is their agreed perception that what each of the things being exchanged in their particular quantities represents equivalent fractions of the total amount produced in society as a whole. It is only by reference to this totality and an understanding of relative to that totality what these two things represent, that one can speak of there being a basis for equivalence. It is not on any metaphysical quality of the minutes of labor or the ergs expended in labor. It has nothing to do with any material fact of the production. And a crucial point, as he is at great pains 
to a detail not only throughout volume one, but even more clearly in volumes two and three, as he deals with ever greater specificity with the realization of capitalism as a system in its entirety, in its whole, including finance, uh, commercial distribution, uh, rent, all kinds of things beyond what he considers in volume one. What is behind all this is the recognition that there is a constantly changing field of production. It is never constant, and in fact, it is capitalism itself that constantly drives innovation and the seeking for improvements in productivity as a means of realizing greater relative surplus value in the short term. Now, the effect of this is to constantly drive down the values of what is produced. I mean, we just look at computers today, and I don't need to say anything more about that. It takes much less time. I mean, capitalism is constantly reducing the amount of labor required for the production of anything and everything. That is the, the I've got a watch in front of me. I've got more than two minutes. That is the fundamental fact of capitalism. So what is it that is going on? At every moment of exchange, what, in, what is involved is not a comparison of labor that has been poured in in the past, but rather at that moment, what is required to replace as a fraction of the total social expenditure of reproduction to replace the articles being exchanged. If, in fact, innovation has reduced the amount of labor that goes into the production of, say, a shirt, all the shirts and warehouses now have less value than they did yesterday. And it is not on the basis of the labor that went into their manufacture, but on the basis of what would be required to replace them under current conditions that they are said to have a current value. And that is the value at the uh, exchange. <clears throat> now, that is absolutely crucial. It is absolutely different from the concept of the uh, commodity as container. It is, in fact, the living form of society as it's realized through innumerable individual events and transformations that we're talking about the social whole. That's why the price and value must both be correct. One starts simply at the level of the individual exchange and tries through agglomeration to come up with a concept of the whole. Now, because you can actually look at prices, you can begin with prices and then develop a kind of macro theory that will always be imperfect, but will at least strive towards an understanding of what all those uh, many individual prices mean as an, as an uh, entity. Marx instead begins with the whole, and in ways that you cannot immediately demonstrate, takes for granted that if there is an exchange of equivalents, the two parties seem to know what they're doing, especially if over a period of time or many uh, exchanges, you can see that this equivalence is fairly constant. Therefore, he says, they represent equivalent fractions of a greater social whole that isn't knowable. The two forms, one beginning at the totality and moving down towards the analysis of the individual, the other beginning with the individual, rising to try and understand the totality, are different but comparable. You can start with price or value. Either way, you can try to understand the social whole, which is very difficult. Now, in this framework, about which much more can be said, what is the fetishism of commodities? It is not having a fetishistic attachment to the accumulation of commodities, which is the most typical common understanding of fetishism of commodities. You want to have commodities. Instead, what he says about it is, it is the reality that there are material relations between persons and social relations between things. This watch was made by living human beings. I will never know them. But people who are alive today had their hands on this. My only relationship is I went to a store and I bought it. There is a material reality. This watch, made by people, Many, many people producing the metals and the uh, parts of it, transporting it here to Canada. Am I going and buying it? The social relationship is between my money and this watch. All right? That is the fetishism of commodities. Like the fetish that symbolizes a clan 
in a hunting gathering society, there is a relationship between humans on the basis of our exchange of commodities. That is a fundamental fact of capitalist society. That is the way we come together as a whole through attachment to things made by other people <laughs> whom we will never know, but with whom we actually have social relationships. That's all I have time for. Thank you very much, Professor Comnell. Our next speaker, our next panelist, is James Pariseau. He is a PhD student from SUNY Binghamton. Uh, his research interests center on historical sociology and political economy, and he is a member of the group uh, of Socialist Alternatives. James? Okay, so I have 20 minutes. Right? Yes. Okay. Um, so my presentation is divided into two quick sections here. So first, um, and it's a direct response to Nitzan and Bickler, is that how you say his name? It's a direct response to their book, um, basically arguing first that their critiques of Marxism come from a misinterpretation of his method and therefore are very problematic. And then secondly, I ask, uh, does their alternative provide a better understanding of capital accumulation than a Marxist perspective? And my answer is no. So to start with, um, I'm currently working in a sociology department, and one of the main, uh, I mean, basically the root of sociology that was sort of Durkheim's main purpose when he was trying to establish sociology as a discipline is there that you're going about your daily life, um, I don't know, buying groceries or riding buses or whatever, um, but yet within our daily life, we know there's a lot more going on than it appears. So Durkheim would say there's these external pressures which shape our psychology and our culture and our social relations and so on. And I think Marx approaches the same question from a very different perspective, saying that we live in the world of uh, fetishism of commodities, there's all these social relations going on, but we don't really know what we are. And then the question is, um, how can we then understand what this sort of more is? How can we understand what are the fundamental forces which really drive uh, society, or in particular, capitalist society. And so here, I want to establish my um, part of my thesis, which is that Nietzsche and Bickler, by rejecting really the usefulness of Marx's categories, such as the labor theory of value, are somewhat more implicitly in the argument, really rejecting the entire process Marx used to build these categories. And um, as I'll try to show, this creates all sorts of problems. Um, so to start by going quickly over Marx's method, um, it's one way to put it is really the dialectical movement from the simple abstract to the concrete complex, moving from ever sort of higher but less totalized levels of abstraction to lower, more concrete, more totalized levels of abstraction. Um, so I mean, you start with some, a small determination, say the commodity, and then from there you can eventually try to understand the relationship between people and the commodity and workers and the commodity and the state and commodity, eventually the world market. Um, and so on. And this, the purpose of this method is then to attempt to penetrate the surface level appearances of things and really find the systemic essences that drive society forward. And the end goal then, um, basically what George was saying, is to understand each particular category in terms of the totality of determinations through which that category has meaning. Um, or in other words, what the philosopher Karl Kosick calls the dialectics of the concrete totality. And in addition, when you're using words, words are like bats, as Bertel Ullman says. The meaning of them is sort of fluid and shifting and changes as your analysis and as the process of abstraction uh, keeps moving forward. And then so after you've done this whole method of really trying to understand the deeper relations which drive society, you can then return to the sort of phenomenal surface level appearance and then um, not only explain why things appear the particular way they do, but how they appear that way is sort of, um, I mean, basically get into the labor theory of value, but why price appears in the particular form it does, you get into those types of things. Um, so, but at the same time, I think that this whole process of using this method to understand the concrete is, in many respects, the largest problem that Marxist 
theory or Marxist social science um, basis. Um, but my argument here, um, and this is what I, one thing I liked about the Capitalist Power book, is that I think they push Marxists on this point. They say, look, if you guys are just having these you know, big theories that don't really explain anything, what's the purpose? We need empirical science. So they present an interesting challenge. Um, but what I would argue is, is this doesn't mean there's a crisis of theory and that we need to abandon Marxism because it can't explain contemporary capitalism or whatever. But I think it means we need to keep working through our theories and keep developing them and updating them um, and so on. So the next question is why do Nitzan and Bickler then reject Marx's method? So let's start by looking at, at a discussion of labor theory of value as a way to get into this because I think it demonstrates their sort of confusion with the whole matter. So in their book first they say, according to Marx, to decipher the secrets of this process is to look behind the front windows of appearance, and to do so we need a theory of value. This is the starting point, the algorithm, that Marx uses to develop much of his subsequent concepts and analysis. But then on the next page they say, Marx started with three fundamental principles. The first was that human history is driven largely by a struggle over the surplus. Second, that um, production and redistribution are inseparable. And third, that regardless of its particular form, surplus is always generated through the labor process. But this is a bit confused. I mean, I'm not sure. They seem to kind of pull Marx's starting point out of a hat without really understanding how Marx got to a starting point uh, in the first place. So, I mean, according to them, it isn't really clear where Marx started. And more problematic is what do they mean by the place where Marx started? So in other words, they confuse, I think, Marx's method of inquiry on one hand and his method of presentation on the other hand. And so a way to respond to this is say, well, Marx's intellectual starting point was that whole sort of method of abstraction, um, and his material starting point was really the relationship between human and nature and um, the way humans use labor to appropriate nature, um, to build the world we live in, and so on. So in other words, Newton and Bickler see Marx's, what they argue is Marx's starting point is actually really more the outcome of his method. Um, and I also want to argue that the labor theory of value then arises out of this method of inquiry. So that the point of the labor theory of value isn't to explain why prices are symbolized in a particular number, why you go to the grocery store and the banana is I don't know, 50 cents rather than 75 cents or whatever. Um, the whole purpose of it was to get past those appearances to explain the essence or fundamental social processes which drive capitalist society. I mean, in this sense, I think it's a successful theory, but I think part of the confusion really comes from misunderstanding of the role of the labor theory of value within the development from more abstract to more concrete levels of abstraction. Um, so, I mean, the whole purpose of the labor theory of value is, is saying that we have to get past the appearances to the essences. Now, these essences, they appear hidden at first, so you need some sort of theory and method to understand them. And so the labor theory of value allows you to then say, oh, look, here's the actual social process through which eventually prices are produced and so on. Um, and so Newton and Bitko then come to argue, well, the labor theory of value is problematic because um, since we can't go around adding up socially necessary labor time embodied in commodities or whatever, um, the theory is logically weightless, as they say. But I mean, it wasn't the whole purpose to show that you can't just rely on a surface level appearance of things, but you need this deeper um, analysis. I mean, I think that's really the point of the theory. Um, and I think a similar argument can be made to the way they interpret the concepts, uh, Newton and Beckler interpret the concepts of productive and unproductive labor. Um, these concepts make sense at a certain level of abstraction in the sense that the purpose of the concepts was Marx was explicitly critiquing uh, bourgeois theorists who are trying to argue, well, look, capitalists invest their money in the production process, they get a return, therefore capitalists are productive. Marx was saying, no, no, this isn't correct. Um, by putting your money in the process, you're not, I mean, it's not productive. The workers are producing all the wealth and they're simply taking it back. So the usefulness of the productive and unproductive labor is for that argument. 
But if you try to take that, what works at one level of abstraction, and then you try to sort of glue it on reality, um, you're missing the point and misinterpreting the concepts because you're misinterpreting the method. So, um, and qu I'll quickly go over their alternative framework. How much more time is there? 10 minutes. Okay, good. Okay, I'll try to keep this quick and leave lots of time for scaling critiques and so on. Um, <laughs> So the next question is, does their alternative framework provide a better way to understand capitalism than the Marxist perspective? And I've already sort of repeated myself, but my argument is that by returning to the surface level of empiricism, they miss the deeper social processes which drive capitalism. So according to Nitzan and Bickler, capital is, they say, finance and only finance. And they argue that the central process which drives capitalism is capitalization. Uh, which is what they say the basic algorithm, they call it, that pushes capital accumulation. Uh, or to quote them directly, capitalization is what they say, um, how much the capitalist would be prepared to pay now to receive a flow of money later. Um, and they argue this type of process goes back as far as 14th century, and the Italian merchant bankers in, 14th cent in the 14th century, but it was only in the 20th century that it became really a full-fledged process through which society was organized around. But I find this contention very problematic. I mean, if you try to apply this to an understanding of history, you have this theory of history which essentially says that Italian merchant bakers came up with this thing called capitalization, then they you know, somehow went around, I guess, Western Europe and then the rest of the world applying this thing called capitalization everywhere somehow subordinate, subordinating industry and the human creative process to this thing called business. Um, so or to put it in, I'll put it in a more concrete context here. So um, go back to say the late 13th century in Florence. You had the development of a wool industry. They were importing wool from as far away as France and the Netherlands that was kind of semi-finished. They would put it into a more finished product, and they would sell it in the Levant, among other places, for goods coming from Asia. But eventually, the English started to develop a wool industry, and they were integrated enough in the world market so that the growth of the English wool industry um, rose at the same time that the wool industry in Florence declined. So what happens after that is you had this process of capital accumulation. Um, I should also note that you had something like 30,000 workers in Florence living off wages from cloth manufacturers. So I mean, even if you want to look at capital accumulation in terms of wage labor, it seems to me that this was very much a process of capital accumulation. Um, but what eventually happened is, after the wool industry started to decline, the capitalists then started shifting their money. They started giving out loans to different sort of feuding, feudal warlords that were fighting with each other, um, and so on. So my point here is that they were using capital in one form, they ran into trouble producing more capital in that form, making profit, and so they shifted capital into another form. They essentially shifted it from a productive form to a financial form. Now, if you look at capital as finance and only finance, you miss the whole point of capital from a Marxist perspective as a process, or as sort of a content, which shifts through various forms. Capital can be productive, it can be financial, it's, um, and so, I mean, if you want to understand history, their concept of capital just doesn't really work. Um, or in addition, I think another interesting way of thinking about capital is the relationship between more fixed forms of capital and more fluid forms of capital. You sort of have this gradation there. Um, but you have to look at capital as material, as part of the production process, and so on, if you want to do this. Um, so, uh, maybe I'll cut that out. Um, so more problematic, and I think for very similar reasons, is their argument that capital is a mode of power, or capitalism is a mode of power, um, which I think sort of confuses the results with the process. Or in other words, if you look back to, say, the history of England, for example, now before you really had a high degree of capital accumulation and the development of more sophisticated financial practices and so on, you had the transformation of social relations, right? You have that classic sort of agrarian relation between the landlords and the tenants and the wage laborers, which then creates a class dynamic which pushes capital accumulation. And then out of this, bankers, I mean, you eventually have things like the formation of the Bank of England, 
as a way to try to stabilize government debts and expansion of the banking system. And so eventually you have capitalization, you have uh, capital as finance, sure, but capital as finance very much results from the fact that the social relations transformed first. And so again, by looking at capital as finance rather than as a process involved in this whole totality of social relations really seems to me to miss the point. So to make my final point here, um, Nietzsche and Bickler argue that capital is a mode of power and to accumulate capital is to accumulate power. But it appears precisely because they reject the Marxist method as I was discussing, they are unable to explain the social roots of capitalist power and most importantly, the production of surplus value through the exploitation of workers. Um, so it appears to me then that their overall attempt to build an alternative conceptual apparatus falls back on basically a surface level sociology of power, which can't explain precisely what it aims to explain, which is the basis of capitalist power, and they can't explain this because they rejected the Marxist method. Thank you, James. Our next speaker is Professor Fred Day from uh, Manchester University, the Department of Economics. Professor Day's research interests center on financial institutions, the history of economic thought, and anarchist economics. <coughs> Welcome, Professor Day. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm here from uh, good old England. Um, I apologize if my accent is a bit odd. I'm not from Manchester, I'm from London. Uh, so I do have a bit of a London accent and as I get more uh, vocal, it uh, deteriorates into a London accent. Um, part of my uh, affinity first with Thomas Hodgkin, who I'll talk about, stems from the fact that he was uh, divided as a Cockney philosopher, uh, as opposed to a Westminster philosopher, and also the meaning of Cockney meaning uh, a cock that lays eggs, and it was a bit of a con trick. Um, but those were words bandied at him by his opponents because they couldn't really uh, beat him on theory. So I'm here uh, with my economic fault hat on, uh, just to point out, to some extent, that notions of um, capital as power have existed uh, for at least 200 years. Uh, Hodgkin uh, makes that plain, and there are people before Hodgkin talking in, in those exact terms. Um, so I'll just introduce a bit of Hodgkin, because uh, he may not have been uh, very well known. Uh, Marx knew him. Um, and quotes him in all the versions of in all the versions of or edit, um, volumes of Capital and in the Grand Visa and at great length in the theories of surplus value. Hodgkin was born in 1787 uh, in Chatham, um, and he shared that uh, his youth that sort of upbringing with uh, some of his later friends, William Hazlitt, uh, but probably more famously Charles Dickens. Um, and he was great friends with both of them, even though they uh, one died before the other particularly became famous. He was also, after he came out of the Navy, which he went into at the age of 12, um, became friends with Bentham, Jeremy Bentham, and he acted as Bentham's secretary on some of uh, Bentham's foreign trips. Uh, James Mill, and um, uh, Francis Place. Uh, in terms of what he did, he formed the London Mechanics Institute, which eventually became Birkbeck College. Um, I remember when I started off doing my PhD, I contacted the economics department at Birkbeck, I thought that'd be a useful place to start if I was going to do a PhD on Hodgkin, and they'd never heard of him. And I did have to point out that he was a chap who formed and started their university, but uh, he was an economist in the economics department and never had it, heard of him. Uh, that's because they're a very um, orthodox university uh, and don't do anything outside of that orthodoxy. He also started writing for The Economist in 1846 and eventually became their first uh, economics editor. 
uh, and where he worked until 57, then retired, um, worked for the Brighton Guardian, and then died in uh, 1869. So it's a lengthy old life. His most famous book was, or pamphlet as it was, lengthy pamphlet, was Labour Defended Against the Claims of Capital, where he makes it plain his purpose is to suggest some arguments in favour of labour and against capital. So in this book, uh, which Marx describes as bursting forth with the notion that capital is not productive, uh, that's how Marx refers to uh, labour defended, uh, he starts his analysis on circulating capital. He makes the point that up until then, circulating capital is viewed as a stock. And Hodgin makes the point that it's not a stock, it's a, to a certain extent a flow. So he makes that distinction. But it's also not so much that the um, commodities are in existence <coughs> before production, is what the, um, if you read James Mill, is the insistence, but that it's social confidence. It's production in a social environment. Laborers work on the basis that they know there are other laborers working in order that they will be able to use their wages to buy the goods that they require to live their daily lives. And as he points out, the idea that bread exists, you know, days in advance before you start a production period is, is total rubbish. But it was insisted that was the case. And even people who wrote in response to Hodgkin still insisted that all the items of um, the labourer's consumption had to be produced and available before production could start. And he ridicules that to a large extent. He accepts that the number of workers depends on the amount of capital that's available to pay them, their wages so they can buy those goods, but he refers to um, circulating labor as coexisting, uh, circulating capital rather, as coexisting labor. And therefore, it's the quantity of coexisting laborers that determine the number of laborers rather than some store of capital goods, as it were. Fixed capital, he moves on to, and um, to summarize it, he says, fixed capital is really knowledge. The actual goods themselves are relatively unimportant. Uh, he does make a distinction uh, which is lost in some of the editions of uh, Labour Defended, that it's the quality of capital that is important and to a certain extent, the amount of capital you need as production increases would diminish. Now, uh, Labour Defended was published in 1825, but in 1922 there was an addition um, retypeset, and that included some of the mistakes that Hodgkin has corrected in the 1831 edition, so it works on the 25, but it also included its own mistakes. And one of the mistakes is the confusion of the word quantity with quality. So one has to be very careful, particularly when you look at modern versions of Labour Defended, because they repeat all the 1922 mistakes. And so to some extent, it's the emphasis that Hodgkin is making is lost. And so he makes the statement that the productive industry of a country, as far as fixed capital is concerned, is in proportion to the knowledge and the skill of the people. He does talk then at some length as to how it is that if these two forms of capital are dependent upon labor, how um, they can be uh, accumulated by the capitalist. And he goes into more detail about that in his later books, uh, Popular Political Economy and the Natural and Artificial Right of Property. But he makes it plain in Labour defended that he really doesn't have a, uh, a labour theory of property. He has a labour theory of uh, sorry, he has a labour theory of property rather than a labour theory of value. Um, and as a historian of economic thought, I've gone through various writings of him and most of his contemporaries, and not many of them had a labour theory of value in the normal sense that we would talk about it. Uh, the purely metaphysical sense, uh, they realised that wasn't the case. John Stuart Mill 
using De Quincey and De Quincey using Mill talk about this at great length in their reviews. Um, that property uh, is determined by labour and to a certain extent the way that we value goods is determined. We have an expectation that goods we valued by labour but they don't have any intrinsic value because of the labour embodied in them. Uh, Hodgkin's quite clear on that. Um, now, Marx, as far as um, his reading of Hodgkin, is always complementary. Yeah? Marx is quite often very caustic, very aggressive, very critical. Um, he does at some point point out one mistake of Hodgkin, but says, well, this is understandable given at the time that Hodgkin was writing and the people he's writing against. And that's the worst criticism you get from Marx. So it would seem that there was something there that Marx uh, recognised. And he does say that in Hodgkin's um, theory of interest, that it is exactly the same as Marx in terms of the falling rate of profit. It's just looking at it from a different, from a different angle. So he never really criticises Hodgkin uh, and placates Hodgkin to his own theory. Hodgkin makes the point then that if we've got circulating capital, um, which is basically coexisting labour, and fixed capital, which is basically uh, what we probably call uh, knowledge based or uh, human capital nowadays, and there are the important intrinsic issues, how it is that these two forms of capital gain the same level of profit. If circulating capital gets uh, a rate of profit because it's um, that which enables the workers to feed and live subsistence, but fixed capital gets a rate of profit because it's productive, there can not really be any um, coincidence between the two. But, as far as economic theory is concerned, and in terms of reality, they do receive the same rate of profit. And therefore, Hodgkin makes the point, this doesn't really make sense. The only way it really makes sense is if the profit is due to the fact that the capitalist has power over the labour of the labourer. And it's that power that, in the sense of uh, capital as we normally see it within a... Um, capitalist financial uh, sophisticated system is based. It's not um, because they're just the mere owners of capital. He, he sees that and he, um, he makes a point, uh, particularly in his later writings in The Economist where he persists in this view, uh, he says in 1854, in fact capital seems to mean when ultimately analysed little more than or very little different from the power of one man, however obtained, over the labour or produce of labour of another. He's quite explicit on that. He's not particularly novel in the sense that he's claiming um, that capital is power. Uh, we get it uh, with a chap called Charles Hall, who is known as a Ricardian socialist. Uh, much as Hodgkin's known as Ricardian socialist. Well, Hodgkin um, was always critical of socialism and was always critical of Ricardo. Charles Hall is a Ricardian socialist, yet he was writing before Ricardo in 1805. And Charles Hall makes the point, he uses different terms, he uses wealth rather than uh, capital, but he makes the point, uh, the possession of, therefore of those things which can obtain and command the labour of man is to be considered as wealth. Wealth, therefore, is the possession of that which gives power over and commands the labour of man. It is therefore power, and into that, and only that, ultimately resolvable. So Hodgkin isn't following any new uh, major thing. His analysis of the productivity of labour forms the basis of labour defended. Uh, he's trying to argue that if you want the labourers to get better working conditions, they do have to be able to justify their claims in terms of the productivity. And as Marx recognised, Hodgkin proves that capital in itself is not productive. All that's productive is labour. Everything resolves into labour. 
And to a large extent, after Labour defended, Hodgkin has almost uh, dispelled capital. So all these, most of his subsequent work concentrates on economics as a science of labour, or um, almost human action. Um, and there is uh, a great affinity with Hodgkin from the Mesians. Murray Rothbard, particularly, um, quotes Hodgkin and uses Hodgkin left, right and centre. And it's odd that you get Marx and Rothbard perhaps both admiring the same writer in that regard. But uh, there is a certain affinity between them, perhaps. Labour defended did shook uh, the establishment. Uh, Ronald Meek, famous historian of economic thought, referred to the name of Hodgkin as a name to scare children with. Um, James Mill and the Lord Chancellor were in correspondence with each other, and you know, their correspondence shows that they made a concerted effort to ensure that Hodgkin's views and his attempts to, to, to um, portray that to the working class movement was almost outlawed. You know, they censored the newspapers so they would not mention it. So uh, after 32, Hodgkin goes into anonymous publications in the main. You also find that he's removed from the various works by people who knew him. John Stuart Mill knew Hodgkin. Um, when James Mill wanted to educate uh, John Stuart Mill, he sent him on a trip around Europe but he sent Hodgkin on exactly the same trip two years beforehand as a dry run. Yeah. Uh, Hodgkin and John Stuart Mill both worked on the Morning Chronicle, the first uh, newspaper that Hodgkin wrote on. But nowhere does John Stuart Mill mention Hodgkin. He mentions um, William Thompson, who was also, um, who actually lived with Bentham, uh, and he was quite happy to mention the socialists but he would not mention Hodgkin because Hodgkin's was seen as so dangerous. Also in answer to Labour Defended, the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge was formed, particularly to um, dispel uh, the power that Hodgkin's uh, works seem to be having over labourers, particularly in London and also in New York. Uh, an American economist, um, John McVicker and Thomas Cooper, right on the problems faced by the diffusion of Hodgkin's work into New York. So Hodgkin didn't seem to have much basic effect subsequently, he was um, suppressed, uh, but what did happen was that, as von Berwick uh, recognises, that after Labour defended, you have to have some other theory to justify capital. And so the theories then move on to notions of abstinence. We get that with George Pollock's group, and later with Nassau Senior, that uh, they're desperately seeking some argument that they accept that labour uh, capital is no longer uh, getting its reward for productivity purpose, but as a, it shifts into a node of savings. And Hodgkin in The Economist particularly makes points that uh, capital isn't really saving, uh, particularly if capital is, the amount of capital you need is diminishing in quantity terms because the quality is improving as technology improves. So didn't have any major direct following in the sense of a school of thought after him, but it has, for a historian of thought, changed how, how capital is viewed and is important for that reason. It's also important because he does crystallise this notion, more than uh, others before him who recognised it, but, but just stated it, that it was power. He actually puts into reasons why uh, capital should be viewed as mere power. Thank you. Thank you to the panellists. Uh, we have approximately 25 minutes for questions and discussion. And I think what's maybe best is we submit a couple of questions to the panel, and then uh, they'll take a turn to respond to those questions, and then a second round of submissions, and so on. Um, I don't know if we need a microphone for the questioners. Uh, there is one up here, if 
if necessary, and I'm just going to point. I don't know people's names. So uh, the first question in the back, please. <laughs> there is this uh, Marxian notion of uh, capital in general as opposed to capital in concrete reality. And as we know, uh, Marx himself worked on both at his own time, actually, in order to develop mar mar capital in general, which is abstract, his theory. He had to work in capital as concrete reality. Um, I think much of the analysis that we hear say today, or uh, for that matter, uh, after Marx, is deal with uh, capital in general, which is true, and it's easier to defend. The problem is capital in concrete reality. For example, there are lots of things that we have uh, discussed, uh, uh, labor theory value, um, uh, and uh, now there are lots of change is taking place. For example, if living labor is the source of the valorization and the generation of capital, now we have industries which have got eight or 10th generation of robots, which has got the minimal living labor in it. How are we going to calculate this? And there are other notions that, for example, the last speaker mentioned to, uh, about fixed capital and fixed capital today is a far more complex capital than it was at the time of Marx. And uh, I hope that this conference on a crisis of theory, because we have heard enough about crisis of capital. You know. Crisis of theory, I think this is what uh, we hope to be able to do in a, in a concrete sense, going back to the uh, capital as uh, in concrete, you know, what's going on today. Okay, thank you. Um, I saw three hands at first. There was Stefanos, then uh, Professor Nitzan and Jordi. I guess, um, one comment and two questions for uh, Professor Komine. Uh, I didn't think that you provided an explanation that uh, lived up to the title of your presentation. I don't think that you explained uh, value and for uh, much. And um, uh, although I agree with most of the things that you said, I think that I would catch up the case. They are well known to most of the people in this audience. I have two, two critical questions. One is um, uh, your discussion of metaphysical language. And one of the fundamental senses of what constitutes metaphysics is simply put something which is not accessible to the senses, something which is not empirically identifiable. Well, in this sense, you didn't convince us that value um, and fulfills uh, the categories of something which is the criteria of something which is not metaphysical. The language in Marx's capital abounds with metaphysical terms. You know this very well. It's not, they're not to be found in chapter one of volume one. Throughout the three volumes, you have terms such as the self-augmentation of value. Uh, there is talk as if something was self-determining, some kind of an autonomous entity which uh, produces inevitable results. This is uh, repeated throughout um, capital. It's not something which is accessible to the working class. I was surprised that you said that. Actually, I would bet that you give capital to a working class person who has not been exposed to a popularization by, let's say, or by one of us or somebody else, and he would have, or she would have no one, uh, idea of what is going on. But this is something to be tested. Totality. That's a metaphysical concept. I mean, right there, because by totality, if it is not a metaphysical concept, you should be able to establish empirically the parameters to tell us what's inside, what's outside, and to identify empirically at least one integrating and regulating mechanism. Otherwise, you have an empirical aggregate like Aristotle operated with um, in the politics. It's very, very difficult. So I don't think that you have established uh, convincingly the argument that, well, uh, value in Marxist capital is not a metaphysical category, it's not a metaphysical theory. Secondly, and that's the second question, if your discussion of the substance of value, I think failed to explain what value is, and to the extent that you said something, well, you didn't do it in Marxist terms. Because if I recall correctly, you discussed and you identified value as some kind of homogeneous human labor power, and you connected this to an exchange of equivalence. But the questions that arise in the field of this are at least two. Well, what about Marx's category, which if I don't recall, we did not use abstract, socially necessary labor. That is very specific, and it is very, something very, very concrete. Um, and if this is the case, then one would have to ask the question, under what conditions does an abstract, socially necessary labor obtain? And they have to be specified both empirically and theoretically. Why does this matter? 
you talk as if any exchange, any individual exchange within a capitalist society, regardless of conditions and regardless of the phase um, of the capital accumulation in which it takes place, um, amounts to, uh, to an exchange of equivalence. Uh, the question is this, during a depression, are two commodities exchanged or two things exchanged uh, and they are capitalistically produced? Are they equivalent? Yes or no? And what does this tell us about what must be in place for the exchange of equivalence? And a part of my first question, which I forgot. Now, the, the charge that much is of values metaphysical, let me know, it's, it's very, very important, is that it is empirically irrelevant. And I was hoping that you would show us a way in which empirical research can be done for Marxian political economy using value categories. Um, and if not, what are the ramifications? I know this is quite a bit, but the main points are two. Metaphysics means something not accessible to the senses, not empirically identifiable. Uh, um, I, I Marxist value, labor value theory, is it empirically operationalizable? operationalizable? And second, what about social necessary labor and under what conditions, theoretical and empirical, does it obtain? Thank you, Stephanos. Professor Nitsen? <clears throat> I'd like to uh, point uh, a certain dilemma and the question I have is for James and I very much dislike the process of actually aggregating questions because it gives the uh, speakers the chance to evade some of the questions. <laughs> so I, uh, I sincerely hope you're going to address my question and I'll try to try make to. it as uh, and specific as I can. And since you uh, reviewed our work, um, I'd like to ask you something uh, quite concrete. <coughs> you speak about uh, sulfur uh, sorry, versus uh, surface phenomena versus deep structures. And you imply in some sense that the, the distinction between them is simply equivalent to what Marx decides, surface and deep structures. Are. And for me, uh, that is uh, not a good definition. Uh, surface phenomena simply are anything our senses can engage with, and deep structures is simply a good theory. Deep structures are ways that we explain with little, quite a lot. Now, Marx's deep analysis, essentially, and I'm reading here uh, from a book on page 100, is that Marx claimed his theory to be superior to the bourgeois alternative, partly because it did something they couldn't. It objectively derived the rate of profit from the material conditions of the labor process. And in a footnote, we quote Marx as saying, prices of production are conditioned on the existence of an average rate of profit, which itself must be deduced out of the value of commodities without such a deduction, an average rate of profit, and consequently a price of production of commodities, remains a vague and senseless conception. That's what Marx is saying in uh, volume three of Capital. Now, what Marx had in mind was that the rate of profit, what you called essentially the, or what he called the engine of capitalism or the source uh, is generated by a ratio of S over C plus V. And that ratio has to be denominated in socially necessary abstract labor time. Now, Botkiewicz in the turn of the century showed that the rate of profit in price terms cannot be equal to the rate of profit in value terms, not only in the individual sectors and industries, but also in totality. And 100 years uh, followed in which Marxists have tried to solve this problem and failed. And they also have tried to solve other problems, including the very definition of the socially necessary abstract labor that's absolutely necessary to determine this deep structure. Now, I think that the options that are facing Marxists now are as follows. Is Marx's effort necessary? In other words, is his attempt to understand the source of profit? Uh, is this useful or necessary? If the answer is no, which I sense many Marxists hinge on, then this is the end of the story. We have no discussion. And basically, in my opinion, you just have a slogan. If it is, yes, if it is necessary to do what Marx tried to do, then how do you deal with 100 years of failures to uh, solve the problem? And perhaps you have some alternative suggestion. 
to what uh, Marxist political economists tried in vain to achieve? That's my question. Thank you. Um, there are a few more questions, but perhaps it's best to give the presenters a chance to respond. Could I ask you guys to speak directly into the microphones and please respond? Um, maybe we could do this in a spontaneous order. Uh, the first, uh, perhaps, George, would you like to respond to the, the claims? Okay. Um, sort of in order. Um, the question of capital in general versus, uh, in the abstract, I assume, versus concrete reality. Um, the first most important point is that capitalism as a system is systemic. And the question is not to begin with, how does its real manifestation diverge from a principle of structure, but rather, what is the principle of structure from which it may then be said to diverge. Um, right across the road at the Schulich Business School, they take for granted that there is some totalizing process by means of the market. Um, and yet, we all know that markets are, in fact, imperfect, and that there are monopolies, not only naturally, but created. However, if you start with monopolies, you cannot explain the general principle of the capitalist system. You have to begin with an understanding of the system and then say, well, of course, in reality, monopolies, when they're created, distort that system in very particular ways. That is one of the ways in which power is directly relevant to capital. If you happen to focus in certain geopolitical areas and certain kinds of commodities, monopolization and power are extraordinarily important. And of course, oil in the Middle East is one of those key examples. But if you want to understand the price of lettuce in Toronto, not so much. Um, it's really more relevant to look at competition in um, uh, uh, Holland Marsh. Um, now, with respect to the question of living labor versus robots, the whole point is to conceive of total social production. Now, ultimately, we are humans living in society, and until and unless we get to the point where our thoughts and wishes can be directly made manifest through a replicator, a la Star Trek or something like that, fundamentally, everything is produced through human labor. Now, human labor may be realized through very elaborate mechanical devices, but it ultimately is a total social of, uh, uh, quantity. And much of what is produced, ignoring the role of labor, is actually produced by people in sweatshops. And we need an understanding of that whole that organic totality that includes all of those commodities. And that is what the labor theory of value provides. It does mean that many commodities have very little value relative to their complexity and usefulness, like computers. You know, computers are a tiny fraction of the cost that they were 30 years ago, and they do incredibly much more because there's an awful lot of mechanization in their production. They're cheap much cheaper in some ways than, than forms of food that people need around the world. Um, so yes, there, there are the ma material realities that you refer to, all of which are explainable within the labor theory of value. And I would argue that you can construct alternative theories based upon prices, but they have to deal ultimately with the same facts and reality. And there is something fundamental to be gained by dealing with value. Now, Stefanos is frankly almost offensive in the way he poses things. I will avoid being equally offensive in return. I do think that I answered in my comments some of what you asked, and perhaps you didn't notice it. However, I will try and respond. First of all, one way of talking about metaphysics is to say it simply refers to that which is not sensible. Lots of the places I quoted from in Marx, before and after the sentences I quoted, he talks about that which is not sensible. However, the key point here is that there is a meaning of metaphysics which has to do with that which is not merely not sensible, but that which is inherently intangible. And value as something that is poured into a commodity in its creation is what I have in mind there. There's no pouring in of value. That conception of value that is fixed at the moment of production is bankrupt and non-Marxist. Marx's concept of value is at the moment of exchange, what fraction of the total 
of social effort required to reproduce society is relatively required for the two items to be exchanged. And if those items are understood by both parties to be equivalent, then in principle, they have the same fraction of that total social. Now, the totality is you know, imponderably difficult to know. But that's what markets do over time. They establish rates of exchange that, although they change, and we'll put aside supply and demand in case the ship bringing the apples to harbor you know, sank outside, so apples rise in price. What the uh, classical political economists refer to as average price refers to a level of exchange that is at least for a brief period of time well established and Marx says it's based upon the equivalence being grounded in comparable, essentially equivalent elements of total social effort, all of which are reducible ultimately to labor. Because even if you have to buy something on the market, in principle, you could hire people to make it for you. And so you, you buy it because it's cheaper than you're undertaking the capital construction to make it. Nonetheless, it all involves labor, and then you have a totality. I mean, I can go into reproducing all of what is involved in capital, but you have to read the book, which, by the way, Marx explicitly intended to be read by ordinary working people, and which, in fact, it was. At a time when they didn't get much public education, had no opportunity to go to university, they actually did read it and formed societies to do that. Um, so uh, in terms of totality as metaphysical, what I would argue is if you believe there is such a thing as society, that Margaret Thatcher is wrong, then you believe in a totality. That is what society is. Now, can you specify it? You know, only in some theoretical sense. It's like a language. You know, we know there are languages, but they are remarkably difficult to specify in time or extent which is one of the reasons why it's out of linguistics that structuralist ideas first emerged. Because in point of fact, it is synchronic, it is diachronic, you have to analyze it, although you can never reduce it to this phenomenon directly in front of you. So unless you believe it's impossible to discuss language, unless you believe there is no such thing as society, then totality is not metaphysical. Um, now, value, as I said, is abstract social labor, I left out of my quotes the parts where I said that, where Marx said that. I did, by the way, that reference to homogeneous labor was a direct quote from Marx. And in the next sentence, he refers to average social labor. I didn't quote that because that is the whole point. Average socially necessary labor time is, as Marx says, the only reasonable way by which we can understand the fraction of total social effort that is required in total social reproduction. It is the quantum of the totality. And that is what it is. I go into details about what that means. And the fact, of course, is that, as Marx recognizes, different forms of labor require different elements of, of uh, production. I mean, to, to, to engage in certain kinds of labor requires skill that must be taught, right? And others are not. And socially average labor time must comprise all <laughs> forms of labor. It's not the lowest common denominator. It is the social average. Um, I do finally want to just say that with respect to average rate of profit relative to prices of production and those sorts of elements, that there is, in fact, necessarily a rate of profit in value terms as well as in price terms. And the question of how you get from prices to uh, value or from value to prices is not a transformation problem that can be resolved mathematically. The equation that Marx offers in capital about moving from vice uh, prices to values is in fact an expression of what the market does. It is a summation, a, a calculus of an infinite number of price points conducing towards a, to a total, a summation. And the whole point is you cannot mathematically go from any given set of values to any set of prices or vice versa. What happens in real life is that society works from 
the total to the individual and from the individual to the total simultaneously in ways that are too complex and with too many elements for us to ever do, just like the integral sign in a calculus represents more than we can individually count. And so what you're doing is blurring the distinctions of many delta x's into one giant calculus of a principle. And it's only an asymptotic approximation, but it works. Now, the thing to understand is anybody who wants to try and do it mathematically is doomed to trying to find a gazillion points of prices. And that's ridiculous. The important thing is not to actually move from prices to values or values to prices, but to understand that they are both manifestations of what is real. One operating on the level of the social totality of reproduction, and the other operating on the way in which individuals must navigate that totality in market exchanges. Thank you, George. Uh, James, would you like to respond? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll attempt to, anyway. Um, I mean, there was kind of a lot in your question, and I'm not sure I um, have the answers to everything. My, my part, my, what I was trying to do was at least open up a dialogue between sort of the Marxists and um, your book. Because one thing I really liked about your book was that it really challenges the reader, I think, to think about what, in a sense, what are the limits to what we can know and what are the methods we can use to figure out what we know. Or, but the question I would really have are what are the limits to empiricism? I mean, from, say, a sociological point of view, if you're studying things like race, gender, and so on, a quantitative analysis doesn't get you really very far. You need um, qualitative analysis. And so thinking through, um, and if, let me know if this isn't quite answering it, but I think one of the issues was really that you brought up was kind of the usefulness of value theory or the transformation problem. How do you, um, because it appears in capital that the labor theory of value, it's, it's presented in a quantitative form. I was just quoting from Marx, and he said basically that he has a quantitative explanation of the rate of profit, which for Marx is the engine and the source of the development of capitalism. Now, Marx says it. Do you agree that Marx is on the right track? And if you do not agree that he's on the right track, I said that there's no point in discussing further. If you agree that what Marx is searching for is necessary, you have to deal with the two chapters in our book in which we show that Marx is not us, mm -hmm. have tried for 100 years and failed. Do you think that you have an alternative? That was my question. OK. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say I have an alternative. I think there's a relationship between the theory of value and the theory of price. Um, I mean, the theory of value, what I was trying to say is that in capital, it's presented in quantitative terms. And it makes sense in these quantitative terms. But it's, these quantitative terms are used to represent a social process. Now, I mean, I'm sort of just repeating what George said, I feel like. but I. But part of the problem I have with the quote from Marx is I don't feel like I could actually answer that question unless I would go back and reread the section of Capital as written so I could contextualize it within the overall process of abstraction that I was talking about. So I'm not sure I could answer that um, at this particular moment. OK. Uh, listen, we're almost out of time, but there are five questions left. So uh, I don't know how people wish to proceed. Um, I don't think we should uh, take more than 15 minutes out of the lunch break. Just because people want that. But if you want to go 15 minutes, that's fine. Please, if you can, make your questions short and sharp. And perhaps, if possible, the answers could be two. So the first one is Jordy. <coughs> yeah, um, first off, uh, um, I, I can speak pretty loud. But um, I, thanks uh, to the three of you. You guys did a, a really were fantastic. It was good to hear uh, defense of uh, the Marxist tradition, which seems to be under attack here. Um, I think like one can be a value theorist or not a value theorist and still work within what's broadly um, thought of as the Marxist tradition. After all, value theory is not an accounting process. And you know, I, I really like Leo's line in the letter back to Stefanos where he said, you, know, you tried to figure out the transformation problem, but, but life is too short. So <laughs> like, 
my, my, my broader point he, here is, and I think that James probably would have hit on this, but maybe didn't have time, or maybe he didn't want to, was that what I see is missing from what I've read of Nitzan Bichler is a theory of exploitation. And since there's no theory of exploitation, there's no theory of resistance. And it seems to me that you can, be, you can quibble about Marx, you can have neo-Ricardians, you have a lot of people who still identify monopoly capital as within the Marxist tradition, but they're not trying to have some, what I see as a covert action or an overt action against what has been th the tradition of 150 years of revolutionary action and of, or of attempted revolutionary action. And it seems to me a political action to attack, to, 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 to take a specific interpretation of Marx, which isn't held by all, Mar all Marxists, you take 10 Marxists, interpretations, you know? But you take a specific interpretation of Marx and you politically attack it. And like it or not, this is the theory of much of the international left and still is the theory. And we can say it's in crisis. I don't think we have a crisis of theory. I think we have a crisis of capitalism, but we also have a crisis of anti-capitalism. And you know, you look at over here compared with France and, and so on, I mean, my, my point is, where, do, where can we find, what, I'm asking everyone up there, what, where can we find a theory of exploitation, in, and, and to Jonathan, and in Nissan Bichler that we, and why such an attack on the Marxist tradition as opposed to saying, okay, like, we know this stuff, and, uh, but we still want to work within the tradition that exists already, as opposed to trying to create a new one within people. Okay, thank you, Jordi. Uh, Jung Chul, could you be, no? Um, after Jung Chul, then Daniel? Um, so this is mostly uh, towards James, a little bit towards George. Thank you. Um, you want to make two arguments, I think. And the first is that uh, Nitzan and Bickler's critique is invalid um, or huh? problematic um, because it's not taking into account um, the way Marx uses abstraction and the way he um, has his method of presentation compared to his method of inquiry. Um, and the second argument that you want to make is Marx's analysis uh, tells a better story. But what I think is actually happening is, uh, to some extent, you're saying um, uh, the first argument, um, the, the critique is invalid because the second argument, Marx's analysis, tells a better story. Um, and I think to some extent, George, you might be doing the same thing, where um, you're saying, um, uh, we need uh, some kind of totalizing theory of total social production, and the labor theory of value produces that, whereas Nitzan and Buckner's argument doesn't. That's all fine, but uh, my question would be, and I think it's a question that's kind of come up to some extent as well, is um, even if Marx's theory provides a better story, Marx considered himself to be a scientist, and he considered himself to be able to explain social processes and not just tell the story um, in order for Marxists to keep on wanting to do that, they have to engage with the problems that have been discovered in the labor theory of value, and that at least a lot of people argue haven't been answered. And I think that that's the part that you would really need to address in order to be able to make the arguments that you're making. Thank you, Daniel. Um, if we could be really, really brief here, Andrew, and uh, then Leo, and then after that we'll... Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of looking at this from a a, an outsider perspective from what's left of the social movements in the U.S. I'm not an academic. And, and so I, I sort of see the same question that Professor Nitzan is asking, but in a different light, which is labor theory of value, um, the theories of value that uh, neoclassical economics employs, both of them in some ways are constant adjustments from a particular vision of a 19th century world. And for me, I'm looking for a toolkit. I'm looking for stuff that I can use to understand how things are working now. And the, the constant adjustments of these old toolkits um, seem to sweep more and more stuff that I need to be able to parse into big black boxes with no tools for making the distinctions I need to make. And that's kind of a different way of saying what, what you were saying, you know. Um, if I start seeing big batches of stuff getting swept into a box of consuming the surplus or socially necessary labor and so forth, but it's a whole set of categories I, that are different for me in 
the organizing work I'm doing and I have to be able to tell them apart. I'm not getting the, the tools generated to do it. So in, in a way, you know, that, that's what I'm looking for. I come to a, a, a conference on crisis of capital and crisis of theory. How do you answer that question? How do you start generating those categories and, and generating those tools? Okay. Thank you. And Leo? Uh, just a few brief comments. I think we'll spend our time much more productively over the next few days if we admit that we're talking past each other, uh, that people are asking different questions, and therefore providing different answers. Uh, there's no question in my mind that if you're looking for an explanation of what calculation capitalists undertake when they move capital from one place to another or when they interrupt capital accumulation, you are not going to find that they do so in terms of the labor union now. And if that is the question that is being posed, then quite clearly it is true that the labor theory value is not useful in terms of understanding that understanding of the dynamics of capital. Um, now, apart from very general things, which Marxists and non-Marxists and every variety in between would say, such as competitive pressures, capitalism is competitive, uh, and turning off the capitalism is entirely misleading in that respect. Although power exists even if you are not a monopoly, or in a different way, uh, and, and uh, where you are small business person. Secondly, um, uh, that's not the only question to ask. Obviously. And it seems to me that the questions that George was offering and uh, the historical ones in particular about when did capitalists start behaving this way uh, that James was, was, was asking uh, are, are very relevant and very important. They're not the same question. They're different questions. That isn't to say we shouldn't be learning from each other uh, because the other questions are important and interesting. And we should also recognize that Marx was attempting to engage with the economists of his time on their own terrain and got it wrong. At the level of what they were trying to explain, the transformation problem simply will not work. At the level of what they were trying to explain, which is how do prices get set and what do capitalists understand as profit. Now, that said, we can't be positivists about all of this, for heaven's sake. Sartre once said, North Americans know everything and understand nothing. And Europeans understand everything and know nothing. And there are problems in both of them. So we're really going to get furthest, I think, this weekend if we try to specify the genuine question that, 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 that Jonathan is asking and recognize the limitations in Marxism with respect to that and recognize the narrowness of the question that Jonathan and then attempt to learn from the things that George and, and, and James were offering at this point, with, uh, that don't, aren't necessarily about the same question. Thank you, Leo. And there's just one more, I'm told, very small question, and then we'll have almost no time for responses. But um, uh, Sorry, did you want to make a quick yeah, question? For, for James, I'm a neophyte. I have no dog in this race. <laughs> said, so, so I'm a neophyte, and I don't have a dog in this race. You said some sentences, uh, which, I, which I wish to ask. Mr. Bernstein, in his book, Against the Gods, with the, the history of risk, it's a neat little book. And he describes that it was illegal in Italy to use Arabic numerals to compute. You had to compute interest with Roman numerals because it was the only way to get through. Okay. Okay? Hence the idea of 10%, pretty bloody easy to calculate. Right? Four and a half sucks. The question is, if you were talking about these things in, in, in Venice, is how are individual people, and I'm trying not to fall into any jargon that I know I shouldn't, but I don't know the things I don't know, is people want to copy the answer from their friend. Assuming most of us are here because we want to be clever or know how not to do that, or at least not get caught. If, if workers are trying to calculate their daily bread, how they're supposed to go is it is harder to calculate, especially if you weren't even given the tools. It's easier to copy your neighbor. So does the power come from the calculation of the mandarins who know how to do this? Whereas in our current situation, we just live in an environment, not I'm not trying to use the word markets, where the calculation is done all the time for free and we don't have to think about it. 
which makes the power situations a bit more nuanced. And I'll shut up. Thank you. Um, Professor Day, did you want to respond to anything in that line of questioning? You haven't had a chance to respond to the uh, Jordy post, something about exploitation, a theory of exploitation. Uh, no, the, the only thing I was thinking of is that when I did my PhD with Hodgkin, it was uh, under Ian Steedman, who did uh, Marx after Schreffer. And um, he pointed out that uh, Hodgkin wasn't stupid enough to get involved in the value debate. Yeah, he kept well out of it, and most of the neoclassicals he, um, that followed Hodgkin did follow that view. That's really all I want to contribute on that technical side. Okay, uh, we're, we're pretty much out of time, so maybe I'll ask the speakers to be as brief as they care to be, and people okay. leave when they wish. Okay, very briefly, I would disagree with everybody who said there's a problem with value analysis. <laughs> and I mean this absolutely and dead seriously. Every aspect of contemporary capitalist society can be totally expressed through value theory. There is no problem. Everything that Marx wrote in three volumes of Capital Works, if you want to sit aside, I'll take the time to show you that everything works. There is no transformation problem, is what I was saying. The transformation problem is a misunderstanding. Now, to a certain extent, Marx himself made a contribution to that misunderstanding. But my point is the transformation between the world of value and the world of price is necessarily what happens in capitalist society as it reproduces itself. And it doesn't matter whether you conceive of value. It happens anyhow. Prices have to work as a system of totalizing the whole. Otherwise, the system doesn't work in any way. However badly it may work, it works to some extent because that happens. Um, so why, however, since in fact values will never be seen, is it worth engaging in value analysis? And the answer is two things. One you alluded to, Leo, and I think it's extremely important. My interest is mostly historical. In order to understand when capitalism existed and where, one needs to be able to distinguish between it and mere profit making and commerce. And I think that precisely the analysis of Marx's terms gives us a lead to that. But that isn't most people's concern here. I think it is exactly what Jordi said, exploitation. Precisely because not only is it explicitly through value analysis that one can understand that in getting whatever is socially necessary, determined by society and changing in its mass as subsistence, workers nonetheless produce a surplus that does not belong to them by the laws of capital belongs to the person hiring them, that is the fundamental explanation of exploitation. The point is, there has never been a society of scarcity. All societies always produce a surplus. And so the question, always. There's never been a society, except in a case of a natural disaster, that hasn't produced a surplus. So the question is, where is it? Who, who owns it and why? Marx explains that in capital and value terms. In price terms, you can't explain it very easily. You just have to resort to the fact that workers have lower income. That I don't think is adequate. It doesn't show exploitation. And I think the key thing here is not only do we demonstrate that exploitation exists, we also are able to demonstrate that capitalism has internal problems that don't go away. They persist. You can explain the development of capitalism over time, and guess what? It doesn't become something that is you know, perfectable. It's always going to create crisis. Um, James, any, any final thoughts? Yeah, I'll try to make it quick here. Um, first of all, I don't think I can address everything. I thought um, Leo had a good point there, too, that we need to maybe clarify the questions. But I want to expand on Jordy's comment, which is, um, and also responding to Jonathan at the same time, in a sense, is that if you want to, I think, test the labor theory of value, you go into the workplace. You see the struggles between workers and their bosses, the fact that they're always fighting back and forth over the value that's produced. That, to me, seems, I mean, in a sense, an empirical way to study to see how the labor theory of value works. Um, and I'll quickly comment on the Italy thing, um, which is that the only point I was trying to make is that Financial mechanisms have developed in the way they have, I would argue, because the social relations transformed first. And so it was a direct response to the concept of 
capital is finance and only finance. Um, but I'll just leave it at that. All right. Thank you to the panelists um, <laughs> for coming from very near and very far. Uh, our next panel will begin at 1.15. We're